one of the most uncomfortable times I've ever been on a plane. A pilot tells a joke that goes very wrong, and a pilot is fired for grabbing some lunch in flight. In this episode of Cockpit Confessionals, coming up. Hey 74 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 74 Gear, is all about aviation. Now this video is the only one in my series that is not family friendly, so if you're under 18, ask your mom or your dad or whoever if it's okay for you to watch a video, or maybe they should watch it first before you watch it, and do what I did always when I was a minor and be totally and completely responsible. Are you messing with me right now? Although I tell a lot of these stories in first person, I'm not involved in any of these, despite what you might think. If you have a story that would be good for the Cockpit Confessional series, just send it to my Instagram, and then, who knows, maybe it'll be on here. All right, let's get into it. Before pilots ever end up flying at an airline, we go through a lot of training. Mostly, you've heard me talk about all the different systems training, where we learn all the different systems of the aircraft, or the simulator training, where we learn how to fly the aircraft before we fly the actual aircraft in real life. But before all of that happens, there's something called in-dock. In-dock is where you get all your paperwork and everything out of the way, and you go over all the different things about the company. When you start flying internationally as a pilot, there is a different risk that you're taking, because some of the places that you go to may not be safe and don't have some of the protections that you might experience in your home or native country. And so what happens is that when you go through that training, that indoctrination period, they start briefing you on some of the different risks and how to reduce the risk or mitigate the risk when you're traveling overseas. And in my case, because I go to every continent and all kinds of different countries, sometimes countries that are in war or all kinds of different things, we have a lot of training that we get as far as mitigating risk while we're in those countries on a layover. In some places that we go, they advise us not to leave our hotel rooms. In some hotels that we're at, there are guards that are around with uh, guns and other things to protect us. In some cases, places that we're going to, we have armed guards that, to get us to our hotel. So I go to some really cool places and some crazy places when I'm at this job, and that's something that I really like about it. But as part of that, we get additional security training to prepare us on how to reduce risk while we're at these different cities. As you can imagine, the people who are gonna be teaching that training are people with prior military experience or people that have experience in lots of hostile traveling. So those guys, as you can imagine, are pretty militant when they're delivering the information in these classes and they expect you to take it very seriously. So during this first week or week and a half, you're doing all kinds of paperwork, you're getting lectures from these types of people about how to mitigate risk when you're on layovers, and all these different things to get you ready before you start doing all the training that you need to fly that plane. So it's a lot of information and it gets a little bit overwhelming at times. So what happens with a bunch of pilots? somebody's going to misbehave. The other thing that you need to know about this story is that usually at every airline, your first six months to a year, you're on probation. And that means you can get fired for anything. If you say the wrong thing to the wrong person, you can get fired. If you go and are terrible in the simulator or terrible through training or anything like that, you can get fired. You're fired. After that year, you have protection from the union that you're with, depending on your airline, and they will protect you. But that first year, it's free game. You can get fired for anything. Someone could just say, I don't like you, and you're fired. And there's really nothing you can do about it. So guys are trying to be on their best behavior, but every now and again, you get someone who is like a child and will end up doing something and misbehaving. And that's exactly what happened in this story. There was a guy sitting next to me in class, and we're just gonna call him Rick. And as we went through this training, Rick was sitting next to me, and there's a lot of whispering and talking that goes on, just like probably you did in high school. It's kind of the same thing. And sometimes what happens is the security people get a little bit antsy and a little bit irritated. So the guy says, you're gonna wanna listen to this story of what happened with these pilots. The security personnel that are giving us these talks and these different scenarios are very serious because to them it's very serious and it is for us. Truth is, it could be life or death. If you're a pilot and you're overseas and you're in a very bad area and you get kidnapped, you could be ransomed or killed. Who knows? So they're giving you a lot of different scenarios. This might happen, this might happen, this is how you can reduce the risk. And basically what happened is he started to tell this story. This is gonna sound similar to something you might have heard in a cockpit confessionals. So the instructor says, you're out on a night out, maybe you're just walking home to your hotel, you're by yourself, and these two girls approach you. And these girls are talking to you and they're being really friendly and they're asking you where you're from and they're giggling and laughing and flirting with you and you're thinking you're just the coolest guy ever. But these girls 
don't just want normal sex from you. Now Rick, who is sitting next to me, raises his hand and without being called on says, so uh, you're talking like they want to do butt stuff or what? The entire class laughed because, like I've told you before, pilots are kind of like children. The entire class laughed, the instructor didn't. But that's not the bad part. The bad part was, at the back of the class, there was a person from Human Resources. Human Resources are the people who hire and also fire people at any company. The Human Resources woman had come into the class because somebody had misfilled out something on one of their paperwork. So she just happened to slide into the back of the class and nobody saw her come in there. So when he says this, the whole class laughed, everyone thought it was funny, the instructor just kind of shrugged it off and continued talking about the story and the different risks that were involved in this particular scenario and how we could prevent it. Every hour or so as we go through this training, usually we'll get a break, we'll go get some water, get a snack, things like that. Well, Rick goes out to get his water during this break period and we see the human resources lady come over and say, hey Rick, can I talk to you really quick? Well, Rick disappeared into her office about 30 minutes later, somebody came in and took all of his stuff out of his seat where he was sitting, and we never saw Rick again. Moral of the story, even if you have a funny joke, it's better to whisper it to your friend than say it in front of the entire class. Unless you follow me on Instagram and you watch my stories and watch all my different videos, you may not know that on the flight deck of a 747, there's actually no door that prevents people from entering onto the flight deck from the seats that are behind on the upper deck. There is a door from the lower deck, but not on the upper deck. Now, one of the best parts about flying cargo is you're able to move around freely. If you're flying passengers, obviously the door, that bulletproof door is blocked and the flight attendants need to let you out and someone else needs to go in there and there's all kinds of procedures and it can be time consuming. So if you need to go to the bathroom, you might have to wait 20 minutes or so before they let you out so you can go into the bathroom and there's a whole procedure that we have to do which I'm not gonna talk about. But when you're flying cargo, you just say to the other person, hey, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. You do an exchange of the controls, you get up and go to the bathroom, maybe grab a snack and then come back and sit down. So that's one of the coolest things about flying cargo. You're able to move around a lot more freely. And that's great until you're flying with someone who doesn't have any common sense. When we have a long day of flying where we're doing more than eight hours, you'll have three or four pilots up there. And usually that's great because you're able to balance out some time to get some rest, eat some food without having to be up there and flying. And it's cool to have that rest period, especially if you're flying at night or you have a really long day, you might get an hour or two nap and it feels great. So in this story, the captain who we'll call Steve calls me up. I'm in the rest area and says, Hey Kelsey, come on up. So I come in and I sit in the captain's seat. The captain goes back into rest and I have a brand new first officer sitting next to me. And so we're up there flying like normal and everything's going great. The captain's in rest and no big deal. I say to this new first officer, hey man, I have to go to the bathroom. What happens in that scenario is there's only one pilot that's gonna be on the flight deck. So he has to take care of the radios and flying. So I tell this guy, I'm gonna be in the bathroom, you have everything, and we do a positive exchange of controls, and now this pilot by himself is in control of everything. Something else you need to know if you ever decide to start doing long haul flying, do these long international flights, while it is very cool, your body doesn't get into a rhythm like you normally do which means sometimes you'll wake up in the middle of the night and you'll need to go to the bathroom, which you probably don't normally do unless you're super old, but when you're doing international flying, your body doesn't know what's going on. You were sleeping at this time and then now you're on a 12 hour time difference and you just ate breakfast when it was dinner time. Your body doesn't know what's happening. So your sleep gets interrupted a lot of times to go to the bathroom, which is super annoying because the only time that happens is when you really have to go to the bathroom. This is a photo from my Instagram. And in this picture right here, I'm sitting in the right seat and you see right behind me those little lights, those are actually the oven. That's the galley where all the food is. So the food is in there, the oven is there, the coffee is there, everything is sitting right in that area. And right across the walkway from that is the bathroom. So everything is pretty close by. So while I'm in the bathroom, Captain Steve gets up because he has to pee and he comes over and looks at the door and sees that it has the red line on it, which means it's occupied, which I've had it happen to me before. It is very uncomfortable because like I said, it's the only bathroom that's on the plane and the only time you get woken up is when you really have to go to the bathroom. So I've had it where I go there and I have to sit for five or 10 minutes and I think, oh my gosh, this toilet is getting blown up and now I'm gonna have to go in there because I can't wait any longer. So anyways, the captain looks there and sees the red line is on and says, okay, whatever. Well then Martin, who is the first officer, is in the galley and he says, man, isn't that so annoying? 
And Steve looks at the door, then looks at Martin and says, uh, who's in there? Because there was only three of us on the plane. And Martin says, oh, that's Kelsey. While he's just sitting there getting his sandwich ready to put into the oven. The captain then leans to the side and looks up and sees there's no one sitting on the flight deck. So he runs up, jumps in the seat, puts his seatbelt on and starts screaming just as I walk out of the bathroom. I, of course, am confused because I was only in there for about 90 seconds, but then I see that Martin is in the galley, the captain is screaming bloody murder and saying a bunch of things that I can't say on this video, and I start walking up there going, hey, what's going on? I, I, I was a little confused of what was happening. Steve tells me as he came up to go to the bathroom that Martin was in the galley getting some food. And I thought, what? no, that can be possible. I, he was flying the plane. And then Martin says, oh guys, no, it's not a big deal. I put the speaker up and turned the volume all the way up on it, so I didn't miss any calls. Nothing to worry about. And then this is what happened. Steve said, sit down to me. I sat down in the right seat. He went up to go to the bathroom, and then he came back about two minutes later and sat down, and Martin was just kind of standing there eating his sandwich or whatever he was eating. Steve sits down and says, Martin, just go sit back there. I don't want to talk to you right now. So we continued the flight. We land. I think we had maybe five more hours to go. We sat up there the whole time, and Steve was furious. We were on our way back to a base, so it worked out okay. We land at the base there, and Steve gets into the van. We go to the hotel, and then Steve ends up calling and talking to the chief pilot, and then Martin got called in, and then we all got called in to tell our side of the story of exactly what happened, and then Martin wasn't ever flying with us again. There's a flight attendant I used to fly with. She used to say, common sense is not that common anymore. Somebody to make a decision that they're not going to have anyone at the controls there so they can go get a sandwich when they can't wait 90 seconds blows my mind. It was maybe one of the dumbest things I've ever seen a pilot do. And to be honest, I don't know what you say at your next job interview when you explain why you only worked at an airline for a few months. I'm not really sure what you say there. I mean, obviously you don't say, oh, I left nobody on the flight deck and I went up to get a sandwich. You would never say that, but I don't know what you do say. In that last story, I talked about having multiple people on your crew. And that is great, especially if you have four people, because everybody has a specific duty that they're gonna do before on the pre-flight, and everybody's able to get everything done very quickly, and it's really, really sweet. For example, you'll have one pilot flying. They'll be loading the box and getting everything ready for the computer so it lays out our whole route and all the information that we're gonna be doing for that flight, and it gets the weather and the winds and all that information loaded in there. So one pilot's doing that. One pilot is doing the walk around, checking the outside of the plane, making sure everything is good there. And they're checking also the main deck where all the cargo is and verifying everything's good there. The other pilot will then be checking the upper deck, making sure that we have all of our food, making sure there's nothing up there that's a safety risk, inspecting everything, making sure everything fits the regulations that we need to do. So everything gets divided up and it's really cool because you have a lot less stuff that you need to do. So in this scenario, when I'm doing the walk around, what I do is I leave my stuff at the bottom of the steps there. I get my flashlight and my vest and all the things that I need. I do my walk around and check everything to get my badge checked. And then I walk up the stairs and put everything on the main deck there and then continue to the next deck where we're going to fly the plane. And the reason that I do that is that I don't want to walk up three flights of stairs and then down three flights of stairs and then do the walk around and then go back up three flights of stairs. And it's just more time efficient. And that's typically what most pilots do, except when it's snowing or raining. And that's because nobody wants to set their bags or leave their bags outside and have them get soaking wet during the time you're doing your walk around. And that's what happened in this story here. I carry three bags with me when I travel. I have one bag with clothes, one bag that has my flight stuff with me, it has my headset, it has my lights, it has all that stuff. And then I have another bag that's just camera stuff so I can do this. So what I do is I take all of my stuff and I drop the two bags, my clothes bags and my camera stuff on the main deck. And then I take the equipment with my headset and my lights and all that stuff and I set it on the upper deck, whereas where all the seats are, I set that in the flight deck. And I walk down back downstairs getting ready to go out and do the walk around. And then as I'm walking outside, I realize that it's dark. I don't have my flashlight. I thought, okay, I'm so lazy. But I look down and I see the captain has his bag open and his flashlight right there. I said, oh, easy. I'll save me a trip up and back down. I'll use his flashlight. Not a big deal. So I look at his flashlight and it looked like this and I thought, yeah, no big deal. Grabbed it out of his bag and started walking down the steps. Remember when I said someone checks our ID before we get on the aircraft? To get my badge checked and then I walk up the stairs and that's for security. They want to make sure 
you are on the paperwork and your badge matches your picture and all that stuff. So there's someone that's usually down there. And in my experience, about 80% of the time, that's a female that's doing that, which surprises me because it is terribly cold outside in some cases, but I don't know, they're out there. And so there's this lady that's standing there at the bottom of the steps. I come down with this flashlight and I'm trying to get it, the flashlight turned on. I can't really find the button to turn the flashlight on and then I look and see that there's a cover. So I open the cover of the flashlight. And of course I'm doing this at the bottom of the steps because that's where I start my walk around. So I open up the cover of the flashlight. I look at it and of course this woman who's standing next to me looks down as well. And this is what the cover reveals when I take it off the flashlight. Bow chicka wow wow. I was confused as I was looking at it thinking, what in the world? But the security lady, she wasn't confused at all. She gasped and then started to giggle. So I looked at her and then looked back down at the flashlight and then realized it wasn't a flashlight. It, it was a flashlight. If you aren't familiar with what a flashlight is, you can see this picture here and realize what it might resemble on a woman's body and, and that's exactly what it is. What had happened was the captain had opened up his duffel bag that he left on the main deck. He had three bags as well, one with clothes, one with a duffel bag, and usually guys will have a set of clothes that we wear once we get into cruise. You've seen me in pictures where I'm wearing a hoodie or something like that. That's my cruise hoodie. I wear that when I'm flying. So that I keep in my backpack. Everybody keeps different things and they have their own routine of where they put everything so that way you know exactly where your stuff is because especially when you're flying, you need to be able to access the things that you need quickly, like my flashlight or different things. I know exactly where to get them when I need them in a hurry. Well, this captain in his bag that he kept that duffel bag, he kept his flying hoodie or whatever clothes that he wore, he kept that there in that duffel bag. So I quickly start running back up the stairs, hoping that I'm just gonna throw this flashlight back into his bag and nobody's gonna be the wiser but he had already come down and grabbed his bag and taken it up to the flight deck. On the side of our seats, that's where I keep my backpack, right on the side there, there's space for a backpack or a duffel bag, and you can keep everything that's important to you right there. Well, this captain's duffel bag was sitting there next to a seat, and this was a four-man crew. The fourth person was sitting right behind the captain, which meant I was gonna sit in the middle seat. The problem is, is all three of them were sitting there, and there I am standing with this flashlight thinking, okay, how do I hide this or get this back in the bag? Or I didn't know what to do. The first officer that was sitting behind the captain gets up to go get coffee. Something you don't know is that the pilots that are sitting up there, the captain and the other first officer, those people that are in the back are gonna be getting them food, drink, whatever they need because they're loading up everything and preparing everything for the flight. So you wanna give them as much support as you can. So when this guy gets up from the fourth seat, which is right behind the captain, I look over, I see the bag is zipped, and I think, well, I don't really have a choice here. So I hold up the uh, flashlight, and I say, uh, hey, Cap, I found this flashlight sitting on the main deck when I was coming up the stairs. Do you know whose flashlight this is? And he goes, mm, no, I don't know whose flashlight that is. And I said, oh, okay, uh, I can just ask the other crew, no big deal. And he goes, no, no, uh, I'll just take it to lost and found. Uh, no big deal. I'll just take it lost and found. So I hand him the flashlight. He puts the flashlight in his bag. I pretended like I never knew that it was a flashlight. I don't know if he believed that I didn't know or what, but I handed that to him and it was easily, easily the most uncomfortable 12 hours I've ever spent on an aircraft. And I was just hoping when it was just me and him up there flying that he wasn't going to ask me about it. The moral of the story is this. Don't be a lazy, whiny person like me unwilling to walk up a set of stairs to grab your flashlight and don't grab something out of somebody else's bag. Terrible idea. If you want to see some more cockpit confessionals, check out this video here, when a flight attendant goes to jail. Or if you want to see some pilots arguing with air traffic control, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.